Good morning, I'm Pastor Joel. And I'm David. And we're, yeah, we're here for Midweek Connection. It's June 22nd here in First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. Uh, I know David and I haven't done this for a while, and uh, I was out of town last week, and it's okay because God's Word is from everlasting to everlasting, and we always have great opportunity to read it together and discuss it together. So I'm um, looking forward to our time today, and, and uh, just uh, as a aside, I guess, um, there are times that David and I actually do prepare a lot of these things and, and look forward to it. We do a little reading ahead of time, and uh, but sometimes we, we don't always get into reading ahead of time. So what you get is uh, our, our take on these things, uh, informed by uh, uh, studies in the past and informed by, I, I hope, is uh, what the Holy Spirit is, is, is telling us. But uh, in no way do I want to think that anything that we even talk about today is necessarily authoritative in the sense of uh, there might be better interpretations. But I do think that the Holy Spirit does speak to us and through us uh, and, and speaks to you as well as you are attentive to uh, listening to his word. So um, I'm glad that you're joining us today and look forward to our time. And so again, these are passages from the daily lectionary text. Some of them will be familiar passages because we usually do midweek connection on Wednesdays, so some of the songs might be familiar. Uh, some of the other texts today, uh, like especially our numbers text, um, I don't even know precisely what it is. I know where it is in context, but uh, we'll find out what it is when we read today and uh, go from there. Let me open this word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for a chance again that we have to read your word. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would be honored by it and that we would be blessed by it. Um, I'm grateful, Lord, that you give us this chance and the opportunity uh, to do so. So uh, bless this time, Lord, and let everything that we do and say be guided and uh, controlled by your Holy Spirit, because you work all things for good for those who are called according to your purposes. And Lord, we do love you. So uh, thank you for speaking to us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start this morning with Psalm 15. Let's see. O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our second psalm is Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from Numbers chapter 16, starting in verse 36 and going through verse 50. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, to take the censers out of the blaze, then scatter the fire far and wide. For the censers of these sinners have become holy at the cost of their lives. 
make them into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. For they presented them before the Lord, and they became holy. Thus they shall be assigned to the Israelites. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers that had been presented by those who were burned, and they were hammered out as a covering for the altar, a reminder to the Israelites that no outsider who is not of the descendants of Aaron shall approach to offer incense before the Lord, so as not to become like Korah and his company, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. On the next day, however, the whole congregation of the Israelites rebelled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And when the congregation had assembled against them, Moses and Aaron turned toward the tent of meeting. The cloud had covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from this congregation, so that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer, put fire on it from the altar, and lay incense on it, and carry it quickly to the congregation, and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, and the plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses had ordered, and ran into the middle of the assembly, where the plague had already begun among the people. He put on the incense and made atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Those who died by the plague were 14,700, besides those who had died in the affair of Korah. When the plague was stopped, Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Our New Testament epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 4. Verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, Neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Our gospel text today is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? 
They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first be last. Our third psalm is Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling to cold of them there, pains as of a woman in labor, as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord our, of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad, but the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go all around it, count its towers, consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. And our final psalm today is from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So, that number 16 passage, um, I think when looking at it in light of Matthew 20, uh, is, is interesting. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the numbers passage, there were some people that came to Moses and Aaron and were complaining that Moses and Aaron and Aaron's family were the ones that were to be priests before the Lord as, as God had commanded. 
uh, these people were already Levites. Korah and his followers were Levites, which means they were from the priestly tribe, but they were not descendants from Aaron and his family. So while they had capacity to serve in the presence of God, they weren't allowed that priestly title. Uh, and so they were uh, they were servants in the in the in the household of God. Basically, this is during the wilderness wanderings. They had they didn't have the physical. Uh, they didn't have the permanent temple structure. They had the tabernacle that they would carry around with them. But and so these Levites had the capacity to uh, to to minister in, uh, before the people, but they didn't have that full priestly title to go in and offer sacrifices. And so uh, as judgment against them. The, uh, the Lord opened the earth up and swallowed Korah and his immediately, immediate family members and the other people that were participating in the rebellion were, were burned by fire that God had sent. And it's one, of these, um, it's one of these Hebrew scripture old stories that we look at and sometimes wonder about, just kind of think, well... Uh, does God really act like that? Does, if he acted like that then, does he act like that today? Um, and so it's certainly a, a story that is worth uh, wondering about because it's one of those truly, um, you know, it, it, it should be troubling to us. But I think what's, what's great about the end section that we read is when the rest of the people uh, rose up against Aaron and Moses and God said, you know, uh, get out of the way so that I can destroy them. What was the response of Moses and Aaron, actually? Very quickly, it said, Aaron took fire from the censer that had just been uh, all of the, uh, the, the altars that had been just covered with brass that those who had been in rebellion uh, had, had tried to bring their, their fire before the Lord. All of those things that they had just hammered into place as a warning, as to be a perpetual warning. When you see this stuff, obviously don't rebel against the Lord. Aaron runs, takes fire from there, and goes and stands between the dead people and the living people, making intercession for these people that had just challenged uh, his authority. And and I wonder how uh, I, I wonder how this informs people that are in leadership within churches. Um, I think that there are people, because of our ongoing um, uh, capacity to sin, even those who have been forgiven, even those who have known the love of Christ. Uh, we we don't always act the way we should. Let's you know. Let's just be honest. There are ways that we have private, personal sins. There are ways that we have corporate sins that we engage in. Uh, you know, gossip and backbiting and whatever that might happen to be. Um, and what was the response of the leadership? Aaron and Moses went and interceded for the people. They went and prayed for them. Essentially, they uh, they stood between the dead and the living so that the plague stopped. Um, and, and I think from that we see that, that because God is such a righteous and a holy God, that sin just does not exist in his presence. It, it, uh, uh, it's not that, uh, yeah, just sin just can't exist in God's presence. Uh, and so when God comes and deals with us, he is making us holy, being in his presence would be making us holy. Uh, and so this is where uh, looking at the Matthew passage and just thinking about how um, God's generosity uh, is so, so evidently abundant that, uh, but we still see people who grumble and complain about God's generosity. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a, a little flip on People could read the number story and be really angry that God is so um, uh, righteous and brings judgment upon people in rebellion. And then on the flip side, they can be so angry that God is so generous. Uh, and so the, I think it really just shows you know, that the overall human problem is we, we don't necessarily like the character of God because it conflicts with our own sense of righteousness, our own sense of generosity. And when compared to God, we, we, don't, we don't measure up. 
God is ultimately righteous and God is ultimately generous and we have a problem in both directions and and I think this is exactly why we need more of Jesus in our lives uh, because we can't be righteous like God we can't be generous like God we have to experience both from God in order for us to be transformed into the way he wants us to be yeah I think that's a good insight that um, we have to remember that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and uh, his character is um, so much more holy and more generous than ours right and so yeah there is this sense that we um, we might not always agree with where God's judgment falls and with where his generosity falls and uh, you see that in Jesus's own life that he was resisted by the religious leaders, you know, the quote-unquote, the uh, good, upright, decent people of uh, Judea, and was ministering to the sinners, to to taxpayers, to prostitutes, uh, to people who we would consider to be um, you know, the bad, the wrong sort of people, you know, bad people who we wouldn't want to associate with and wouldn't want our children to associate with. And yet that, it's, it's so, um, you know, it's, it's, it just kind of turns things on its head. And, and that is one of the things that offended the Pharisees about Jesus. Um, that he was, he was so harsh on the, on, you know, the good religious church going people of his day and so merciful to the sinners. But we have to remember that as in you know, this Romans passage, you know, talks about God um, reckoning the faith of Abraham as righteousness and, and how we also are counted righteous before him because of the work of Jesus. Right. When we look at God's judgment and God's grace and and wonder why God shows mercy to certain people and, and, and judgment to others when we might have done something different. We have to remember that he showed mercy to us. Right. And uh, no one can argue that they deserve God's mercy or grace. Uh, it is an act of God's sovereign freedom, an act of uh, pure grace and love that he uh, chose to save us and, and credits us with a righteousness that we could never uh, that we could never obtain on our own yeah. a righteousness not our own yeah mm -hmm. Christ's righteousness mm -hmm. yeah uh, because if it were dependent upon the law you know as, as we see in numbers these people had the law mm -hmm. they had it it was freshly given to them. It might have been a few years later, but uh, they had the tablets that God had touched with his own finger. You know, they had evidence of God's provision with, with manna and quail in the wilderness, with, with, with a rock that followed them, spewing forth water that we know later on, we find out the rock was Christ, you know, uh, even the mystery of that but if it were the laws as it says in Romans if it was the law that were to have saved us these are the people that probably should have been best saved because they were so close to the law it was new and real to them whereas it's sometimes very distant even from us uh, but that's where again it's, it's about faith where the promise that God made to Abraham who preceded the law uh, that is the covenant relationship that we have been grafted into by, by the by the blood of Christ. Um, yeah, I think the scripture is very clear that um, we are not saved by being decent, upright people. We're not saved by being the right sort of person, by being successful. Um, we're not even saved by being virtuous or, or good. Uh, we're saved by grace. Amen. 
and uh, you know the good the good works come out of our come out of our thankfulness to God. They don't they don't give us extra credit right. in His eyes uh, above and beyond other people. Um, it's it's important that we remember that. Absolutely. Uh, wow. Um, once again, I think how important it is for us to be familiar with the whole story of Scripture uh, from creation to redemption, from Genesis to Revelation, all the points in between. And I know that Numbers can be a complicated and strange book even to read, but I'm, I'm so touched by the intercession that Moses and Aaron make for the people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just, it's a good reminder to me as a pastor, you know, my, my job is to intercede for the people. Uh, yeah, and you know, you, you hate to, it, it, you hate to make it sound so melodramatic, you know, standing between the dead and the living, you know, but um, uh, uh, who are we to, uh, who are we to question, you know, God's uh, sovereignty over, over life and death? But who are we even to resist the call that God has put onto, onto our lives, those who have been called into ministry? Uh, uh, actually, every Christian that has been called into ministry of love and service to people in our community. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not just uh, the elders' jobs. It's uh, not just the deacons' jobs. It's, it's every Christian called by his name uh, to minister to those uh, in their neighborhoods, those in their workplaces. But, but that numbers passage for me as a pastor just speaks to, again, reminds me of my role. My job is to intercede, uh, to pray for, um, and to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to ask God to you know, remember that mercy and remember that grace that's available to us all in Jesus Christ. So you have any additional thoughts or anything or that's yeah that's pretty good stuff thanks for reading with me today david and appreciate your thoughts um, on these passages uh would you like to close us in prayer sure all right uh heavenly father uh, we thank you for the gift of your grace and the righteousness accredited to us through the, the death and resurrection of your son jesus Lord, we're, we're ever thankful and, and amazed by that work of grace and generosity. Lord, may we, uh, may we never lose our, our wonder at your love and mercy. Lord, help us to see people with your eyes as your beloved children, as lost sheep. And help us to be instruments of your grace and mercy in the world. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, for whose kingdom we wait every day. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. And again, we're here at First Presbyterian Church, and we do worship on Sunday mornings at 1030. You are all welcome and invited to attend in person if that's possible. You can tune in online and watch uh, either from our website or from YouTube. And uh, if you have questions or comments or concerns or prayer requests, please do come uh, call up to the office. And we can certainly listen to those and, and pray with you. So I hope you all have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.